The Law of Success, Lesson 16, The Golden Rule. You can do it if you believe you can. With this lesson, we approach the apex of the pyramid of this course on the Law of Success. This lesson is the guiding star that will enable you to use profitably and constructively the knowledge assembled in the preceding lessons. There is more power wrapped up in the preceding lessons of this course than most men could trust themselves with. Therefore, this lesson is a governor that will, if observed and applied, enable you to steer your ship of knowledge over the rocks and reefs of failure that usually beset the pathway of all who come suddenly into possession of power. For more than twenty-five years, I have been observing the manner in which men behave themselves when in possession of power, and I have been forced to the conclusion that the man who attains it in any other than by the slow step-by-step -step process is constantly in danger of destroying himself and all whom he influences. It must have become obvious to you long before this that this entire course leads to the attainment of power of proportions which may be made to perform the seemingly impossible. Happily, it becomes apparent that this power can only be attained by the observance of many fundamental principles, all of which converge in this lesson, which is based upon a law that both equals and transcends in importance every other law outlined in the preceding lessons. Likewise, it becomes apparent to the thoughtful student that this power can endure only by faithful observance of the law upon which this lesson is based, wherein lies the safety valve that protects the careless student from the dangers of his own follies, and protects also those whom he might endanger if he tried to circumvent the injunction laid down in this lesson. To prank with the power that may be attained from the knowledge wrapped up in the preceding lessons of this course, without a full understanding and strict observance of the law laid down in this lesson, is the equivalent of pranking with a power which may destroy as well as create. I am speaking now not of that which I suspect to be true, but of that which I know to be true. The truth upon which this entire course, and this lesson in particular, is founded, is no invention of mine. I lay no claim to it except that of having observed its unvarying application in the everyday walks of life over a period of more than twenty-five years of struggle, and of having appropriated as much of it as, in the light of my human frailties and weaknesses, I could make use of. If you demand positive proof of the soundness of the laws upon which this course in general and this lesson in particular is founded, I must plead inability to offer it except through one witness, and that is yourself. You may have positive proof only by testing and applying these laws for yourself. If you demand more substantial and authoritative evidence than my own, then I am privileged to refer you to the teachings and philosophy of Christ, Plato, Socrates, Epictetus, Confucius, Emerson, and two of the more modern philosophers, James and Münsterberg, from whose works I have appropriated all that constitutes the more important fundamentals of this lesson, with the exception of that which I have gathered from my own limited experience. For more than four thousand years, men have been preaching the golden rule as a suitable rule of conduct among men, but unfortunately the world has accepted the letter while totally missing the spirit of this universal injunction. We have accepted the golden rule philosophy merely as a sound rule of ethical conduct, but we have failed to understand the law upon which it is based. I have heard the golden rule quoted scores of times, but I do not recall ever having heard an explanation of the law upon which it is based, and not until recent years did I understand that law, from which I am led to believe that those who quoted it did not understand it. The golden rule means, substantially, to do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you if your positions were reversed. But why? What is the real reason for this kindly consideration of others? The real reason is this. There is an eternal law through the operation of which we reap that which we sow. When you select the rule of conduct by which you guide yourself in your transactions with others, you will be fair and just, very likely, if you know that you are setting into motion, by that selection, a power that will run its course for weal or woe in the lives of others, returning, finally, to help or to hinder you according to its nature. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It is your privilege to deal unjustly with others, but if you understand the law upon which the golden rule is based, you must know that your unjust dealings will come home to roost. 
If you fully understand the principles described in Lesson 11 on accurate thought, it will be quite easy for you to understand the law upon which the Golden Rule is based. You cannot pervert or change the course of this law, but you can adapt yourself to its nature, and thereby use it as an irresistible power that will carry you to heights of achievement which could not be attained without its aid. This law does not stop by merely flinging back upon you your acts of injustice and unkindness toward others. It goes further than this, much further, and returns to you the results of every thought that you release. Therefore, not alone is it advisable to do unto others as you wish them to do unto you, but to avail yourself fully of the benefits of this great universal law, you must think of others as you wish them to think of you. The law upon which the golden rule is based begins affecting you, either for good or evil, the moment you release a thought. It has amounted almost to a worldwide tragedy that people have not generally understood this law. Despite the simplicity of the law, it is practically all there is to be learned that is of enduring value to man, for it is the medium through which we become the masters of our own destiny. Understand this law, and you understand all that the Bible has to unfold to you. For the Bible presents one unbroken chain of evidence in support of the fact that man is the maker of his own destiny, and that his thoughts and acts are the tools with which he does the making. During ages of less enlightenment and tolerance than that of the present, some of the greatest thinkers the world has ever produced have paid with their lives for daring to uncover this universal law so that it might be understood by all. In the light of the past history of the world, it is an encouraging bit of evidence in support of the fact that men are gradually throwing off the veil of ignorance and intolerance to note that I stand in no danger of bodily harm for writing that which would have cost me my life a few centuries ago. While this course deals with the highest laws of the universe, which man is capable of interpreting, the aim nevertheless has been to show how these laws may be used in the practical affairs of life. With this object of practical application in mind, let us now proceed to analyze the effect of the golden rule through the following incident. The Power of Prayer No, said the lawyer, I shan't press your claim against that man. You can get someone else to take the case or you can withdraw it, just as you please. Think there isn't any money in it? There probably would be some little money in it, but it would come from the sale of the little house that the man occupies and calls his home. But I don't want to meddle with the matter anyhow. Got frightened out of it, eh? Not at all. I suppose likely the fellow begged hard to be let off. Well, yes, he did. And you caved in, likely? Yes. What in creation did you do? I believe I shed a few tears. And the old fellow begged you hard, you say? No, I didn't say so. He didn't speak a word to me. Well, may I respectfully inquire whom he did address in your hearing? God Almighty. Ah, he took to praying, did he? Not for my benefit in the least. You see, I found the little house easily enough and knocked on the outer door, which stood ajar. But nobody heard me, so I stepped into the little hall and saw through the crack of a door a cozy sitting room. And there on the bed with her silver head high on the pillows was an old lady who looked for all the world just like my mother did the last time I ever saw her on earth. Well, I was on the point of knocking when she said, Come, father, now begin. I'm all ready and down on his knees by her side went an old white-haired man, still older than his wife, I should judge, and I couldn't have knocked then for the life of me. Well, he began. First he reminded God they were still his submissive children, mother and he, and no matter what he saw fit to bring upon them, they shouldn't rebel at his will. Of course, it was going to be very hard for them to go out homeless in their old age, especially with poor mother so sick and helpless. And oh, how different it all might have been if only one of the boys had been spared. Then his voice kind of broke, and a white hand stole from under the coverlet and moved softly over his snowy hair. Then he went on to repeat that nothing could be so sharp again as the parting with those three sons, unless mother and he should be separated. But at last he fell to comforting himself with the fact that the dear Lord knew that it was through no fault of his own that mother and he were threatened with the loss of their dear little home which meant beggary and the almshouse, a place they prayed to be delivered from entering if it should be consistent with God's will. And then he quoted a multitude of promises concerning the safety of those who put their trust in the Lord. In fact, it was the most thrilling plea to which I ever listened, 
and at last he prayed for God's blessing on those who were about to demand justice. The lawyer then continued, more lowly than ever, and I believe I'd rather go to the poorhouse myself tonight than to stain my heart and hands with the blood of such a prosecution as that. Little afraid to defeat the old man's prayer, eh? Bless your soul, man, you couldn't defeat it, said the lawyer. I tell you he left it all subject to the will of God, but he claimed that we were told to make known our desires unto God. But of all the pleadings I ever heard, that beat all. You see, I was taught that kind of thing myself in my childhood. Anyway, why was I sent to hear that prayer? I am sure I don't know, but I hand the case over. I wish, said the client, twisting uneasily, you hadn't told me about the old man's prayer. Why so? Well, because I want the money the place would bring. But I was taught the Bible straight enough when I was a youngster, and I'd hate to run counter to what you tell about it. I wish you hadn't heard a word about it, and another time I wouldn't listen to petitions not intended for my ears. The lawyer smiled. My dear fellow, he said, you're wrong again. It was intended for my ears, and yours too, and God Almighty intended it. My old mother used to sing about God's moving in a mysterious way, as I remember it. Well, my mother used to sing it too, said the claimant, as he twisted the claim papers in his fingers. You can call him in the morning, if you like, and tell mother and him the claim has been met. In a mysterious way, added the lawyer, smiling. Neither this lesson, nor the course of which it is a part, is based upon an appeal to maudlin sentiment. But there can be no escape from the truth that success, in its highest and noblest form, brings one, finally, to view all human relationships with a feeling of deep emotion, such as that which this lawyer felt when he overheard the old man's prayer. It may be an old-fashioned idea, but somehow I can't get away from the belief that no man can attain success in its highest form without the aid of earnest prayer. Prayer is the key with which one may open the secret doorway referred to in Lesson 11. In this age of mundane affairs, when the uppermost thought of the majority of people is centered upon the accumulation of wealth, or the struggle for a mere existence, it is both easy and natural for us to overlook the power of earnest prayer. I am not saying that you should resort to prayer as a means of solving your daily problems which press for immediate attention. No, I am not going that far in a course of instruction which will be studied largely by those who are seeking in it the road to success that is measured in dollars. But may I not modestly suggest to you that you at least give prayer a trial after everything else fails to bring you a satisfying success? Thirty men, red-eyed and disheveled, lined up before the judge of the San Francisco police court. It was the regular morning company of drunks and disorderlies. Some were old and hardened. Others hung their heads in shame. Just as the momentary disorder attending the bringing in of the prisoners quieted down, a strange thing happened. A strong, clear voice from below began singing, Last night I lay a-sleeping, there came a dream so fair. Last night. It had been for them all a nightmare or a drunken stupor. The song was such a contrast to the horrible fact that no one could fail of a sudden shock at the thought the song suggested. I stood in old Jerusalem, beside the temple there, the song went on. The judge had paused. He made a quiet inquiry. A former member of a famous opera company known all over the country was awaiting trial for forgery. It was he who was singing in his cell. Meantime the song went on, and every man in the line showed emotion. One or two dropped on their knees. One boy at the end of the line, after a desperate effort at self-control, leaned against the wall, buried his face against his folded arms, and sobbed, Oh, mother, mother! The sobs, cutting to the very heart the men who heard, and the song, still welling its way through the courtroom, blended in the hush. At length one man protested. Judge, said he, have we got to submit to this? We're here to take our punishment. But this... He, too, began to sob. It was impossible to proceed with the business of the court. Yet the court gave no order to stop the song. The police sergeant, after an effort to keep the men in line, stepped back and waited with the rest. The song moved on to its climax. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest, 
Hosanna forevermore. In an ecstasy of melody, the last words rang out, and then there was silence. The judge looked into the faces of the men before him. There was not one who was not touched by the song, not one in whom some better impulse was not stirred. He did not call the cases singly, a kind word of advice, and he dismissed them all. No man was fined or sentenced to the workhouse that morning. The song had done more good than punishment could possibly have accomplished. You have read the story of a golden rule lawyer and a golden rule judge. In these two commonplace incidents of everyday life, you have observed how the golden rule works when applied. A passive attitude toward the golden rule will bring no results. It is not enough merely to believe in the philosophy while at the same time failing to apply it in your relationships with others. If you want results, you must take an active attitude toward the golden rule. A mere passive attitude, represented by belief in its soundness, will avail you nothing. Nor will it avail you anything to proclaim to the world your belief in the golden rule while your actions are not in harmony with your proclamation. Conversely stated, it will avail you nothing to appear to practice the golden rule while at heart you are willing and eager to use this universal law of right conduct as a cloak to cover up a covetous and selfish nature. Murder will out. Even the most ignorant person will sense you for what you are. Human character does evermore publish itself. It will not be concealed. It hates darkness. It rushes into light. I heard an experienced counselor say that he never feared the effect upon a jury of a lawyer who does not believe in his heart that his client ought to have a verdict. If he does not believe it, his unbelief will appear to the jury despite all his protestations and will become their unbelief. This is that law whereby a work of art of whatever kind sets us in the same state of mind wherein the artist was when he made it. That which we do not believe we cannot adequately say, though we may repeat the words ever so often. It was this conviction which Swedenborg expressed when he described a group of persons in the spiritual world endeavoring in vain to articulate a proposition which they did not believe. But they could not, though they twisted and folded their lips even to indignation. A man passes for what he is worth. What he is engraves itself on his face, on his form, in his fortunes, in letters of light which all men may read but himself. If you would not be known to do anything, never do it. A man may play the fool in the drifts of a desert, but every grain of sand shall seem to see. Emerson it is the law upon which the golden rule philosophy is based, to which Emerson has reference in the foregoing quotation. It was this same law that he had in mind when he wrote the following. Every violation of truth is not only a sort of suicide in the liar, but is a stab at the health of human society. On the most profitable lie, the course of events presently lays a destructive tax, whilst frankness proves to be the best tactics, for it invites frankness, puts the parties on a convenient footing, and makes their business a friendship. Trust men, and they will be true to you. Treat them greatly, and they will show themselves great, though they make an exception in your favor to all their rules of trade. 